<laughs> I like that question. What's the order? <laughs> Just what we did. <laughs> Your grace. Do it again. Hey, we're getting ready to start here, Ridge Church family hey, and friends. Guys. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. Big hugs. Social distancing hugs. <laughs> You're all hugged Social and and kissed with a holy kiss. Yes. <laughs> Three thousand. Hey, listen. Good morning, everybody. Go ahead, check on in to the to the Ridge Church. Check on in like you're here. Start a watch party. Share the share the feed. We're gonna get ready to start here in just a minute. Uh, we do have a few people here because, like I said, my door is open if I'm here. Amen. So we're going to go ahead and pray, and we're going to get started here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the gift of your spirit and the gift of your word that are penetrating hearts and changing hearts and lives and minds. We thank you for it, Father. We thank you for your word and your presence here. Oh, I can feel the presence of God so strong here this morning. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we love you. You are welcome, Lord. Jesus. We're here for you. We've gathered for yes, you Jesus. to worship you, to be with you, Jesus, mm -hmm. and to be with each other. We love you. We thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. I have roses here if you want to come by and get one. Amen? Praise the Lord. Well, let's go ahead and get started with some worship music. Well, happy Mother's Day, just like David said. And we miss you guys. And we just welcome you into this service this morning. If you're watching, Lord, if you're watching uh, videos, Lord, and I just uh, thank all of our mothers out there, Lord, and all the mothers that uh, that have not borne their own children that have cared for other children. We include you in that. Your great grace, oh, sir. 
But your grace, your grace finds us, Lord. Yes. And I just pray, Father, that as we contemplate these things, Lord Jesus, that our hearts will go and that our battle, Lord, would be in prayer, Lord Jesus. And that you would remind us, Lord, all the things that you have done, Lord Jesus, all the things that you have done for us, Lord, that we would remember the loaves and the fishes, Lord Jesus, that we would remember, Lord, as, uh, as the Jews walked across the sea, Lord, where you made a way, you made a way, and you will make a way for us today, Lord. Remind us, Lord Jesus, let our hearts and our focus be on the good things that you have done. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Walking around these halls, I thought well they fall, but you have never. Thank you. 
praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, King over all kings. Yes, Jesus, Lord. head over all nations. Jesus. Praise your holy name. Oh, Lord glory Jesus. Oh, glory Lord Jesus, we glorify you. Yes, Lord. We glorify you and magnify you. Praise we exalt Praise you. Jesus. There's no other name under heaven and earth by which man can and must be saved than the name of Jesus. Oh, we love you. We worship you, Jesus, yes. King Jesus, Jesus, Lord eternal, yes. reigning on your throne eternal. We love you. Yes. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. And we are loved by him. John said, the disciple, the apostle John said, He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. Amen. You're the disciple whom Jesus loves. Amen. You're the one he loves. He loves you. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you, when you find someone who loves you, just baggage and all, you just want to do good for them. Amen. I'm telling you, I mean, I, you know, it's Mother's Day and I've got, I've got the best wife because she puts up with all my baggage. Boy, does she. Boy, I'm telling you. She loves me and I love her so much. There's no one else I'd rather spend time with than Jesus and Kathy. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. They're my two favorites. Yeah, I love you too, sweetheart. It's my, my, my girl. My girl, she's, she's, she's the one, this precious one here. We love her so much. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. You know, when you read these letters to the churches, you ought to read them personally. Because you're the church now, right? We're the church now. So this is, it's, like, it's like God is using Paul 2,000 years ago to write a letter to you. Amen? And he says, uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 6, he says, Well, we're getting ready to take tithe and offering this morning. We have not ceased to take tithe and offering. Why? Because tithe and offering isn't for me. It's your giving to God. Our giving to God doesn't cease... Because a government or a governor tells you you can't meet. Our lives before God don't cease 
because someone tells you that your ideas and the things that you believe are outdated and antiquated and that you need to, you need to evolve. Your belief needs to evolve. No. Our belief needs to evolve from what it was into scriptural belief. That's the only evolution that needs to take place. Verse 6, he says, but this I say to you, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Well, let's just talk about kind of just in general terms. If you're going to plant a garden and you're putting seeds in your garden, if you put two or three seeds in the dirt, how much are you actually going to expect to get back from that? Maybe two or three plants. But if you plant 20 seeds of the same thing, you're going to expect to receive more plants, aren't you? Well, the more you invest into God, the more you will get out of God. Someone might say, well, I don't hardly have anything. God doesn't, God doesn't even seem to notice me. Well, how much are you noticing him? How much are you doing in terms of giving to him? Giving him your life, giving him your livelihood, sowing your love and your, your, your time into him. Okay, so this is, see, they're writing to an agrarian society. Agrarian. That's agricultural. They're people who farm and fish and hunt. So we speak in terms of that. We could say, if you, if you buy one stock, Kathy and I often think back, wouldn't it have been smart of us or wise if we'd have thought when, when Martha Stewart was in jail and she was going to get out, <laughs> that she might have a big comeback. If we had purchased stock in Martha Stewart, how rich we would be today. But we didn't. But we didn't, and now we don't have that to reap from. Do you understand what I'm saying now? If you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. Amen? So this is what he says. And then he says, he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. That, of necessity. That, that's, that's like when somebody says, if you'll sow $1,000 into this ministry, I'm going to send you this point of contact interest thing that it's going to help you. And so you're buying favor. It's, it's like when, when, someone, when someone says you need to give your tithe to, to God or everything you have is going to be cursed. Well, that's given to the Godfather. You're given out of necessity. I told you last week, I think it was, I quit tithing for an entire year because I heard some preacher, a famous preacher, say, if the first check you write isn't your tithe check, all your finances are cursed. And then he went on to say, I write my tithe check and I set it aside and I turn it in, you know, at the first opportunity I have. How many of you, when you get paid, you think to yourself, okay, 10% of what I just got goes to God. So you're setting aside in your heart what you're going to give. You've set it aside. You've purposed in your heart that that's what you're going to do. And you do that. And then sometimes you say, ooh, I feel like giving a little bit more. I do that. Okay? So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. So nobody's forcing anybody to give. Okay? We're, we don't do that. We don't. My, my, my dad was saying that um, there, there's a denomination that sends you a reminder that you, you, you need to pay your tithe this month. And then they'll tell you, based on how much you've tithed before, how much you should tithe this month. All right? That's, that's, that's like the, the EV Free Church, the Evangelical Free Church. You know, they started because they decided that it was silly for a person to have to buy their pew in order to sit in church. Right? That's grudgingly. God loves a cheerful giver. I love to give to God. Do you know Abraham, when he gave to Melchizedek, he gave because he went and Melchizedek came out and, and took communion, made covenant with him, and then Abraham gave him a tenth of all his spoils. Jesus, it says, for the joy set before him died for you. So Jesus is the perfect example of the cheerful giver, isn't he? And God is able to make all grace abound to you, toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things might have an abundance for every good work. Amen? See, God wants you to have an abundance. He wants you to have more, more than enough. Why? Because it looks good to him. If his children are doing well, listen, if your children are doing well, you, we do what we say. We say, we have, I, I'm so proud of my child. They're doing so well, right? 
right? It gives you a sense, it gives you a sense of joy and, 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 and satisfaction in your heart to know that your children are doing well. Well, God is the same way. It gives him joy to know that his children are doing well. Amen? Well, praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you this morning that you have given to us, and so we graciously, lovingly, and joyfully, cheerfully give to you. We give back to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, that this tent that you've asked for or, or whatever you've put in our hearts that we have purposed, that this is what you have told us to give, this is what we're giving. And we do it today joyfully, cheerfully, and gladly in Jesus' name. And you all know that you can give now. You can give by check. You can send that in. Um, if you're here, uh, you, can, you can give to uh, my myself or, or, or Bobby over here. Um, he's, he's got a basket. If you've got something, you know, raise it up. Uh, we, we're not used to having so many people, people in here right now. So, so you see there, there's some hands here. So go ahead and, and if you could pass that around. And then you can also give online. You can give, you can give through, our, uh, through our website. We have online giving available now. You know, I, I got to tell you, this whole pandemic thing actually worked out really well for us. It put us in a position where we're now reaching more people because we live I live stream twice a week. I'm getting more people uh, that are watching, that are able to watch, that can't make it to church, that are watching on a regular basis. People that don't normally go to church are watching. And it caused us to go ahead and take this, the, the plunge into online giving. So now... We've increased our platform in many ways, which is one of those things that we prayed about almost a year ago Amen. on Friday morning prayer. We were praying, and I just kept getting this platform, increased platform. And, and you know, silly me, you know, you can hear something like that when you're praying, and then you don't ask God, what does that mean? Well, then the pandemic comes around, and it, he shows you what it means to increase your platform. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray before we have the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you give to me, make it personal, that you give to me the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. I pray that the eyes of my understanding are enlightened, that I would know the hope of your calling and the glorious inheritance. Hallelujah. The glorious inheritance. Hallelujah. That you have prepared for us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, I know, you know, there's uh, this news going around. Uh, I, you probably have heard it if you hadn't heard it already. Um, there are 3,000 churches in California. 3,000 churches in California. Look at that. God has a remnant, Amen. even in California. Amen. Who knew there were 3,000 churches in California? Much less that 3,000 churches would unanimously agree and come together that they are officially opening their doors on May 31st. Yeah. Well, we're going to be with them. Now, y'all are giving away that you're here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not here by myself. We've got a plenty of people here this morning. We have just never closed the doors to people and said that you can't come. And, well, that's not true. We did it first. Um, um, but as this thing has progressed and gone on, did you know that in, in the president's uh, giving back control over the stay in shelter, that churches are in phase one of his reopening plan. Oh, that's good. Churches were, but it's up to the states. Anyway, I'm just putting that out there. It was, and we're in phase one of the president's plan. Anyway, we have, we've left the doors open, and, and uh, it's, it's getting to the point here where I'm going to have to start coming to the church on Wednesday nights because there's too many mosquitoes on my deck. <laughs> if you've been watching, you've noticed there's too many. I mean, you probably heard them buzzing around my phone. And, 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 and if you're here for the first time, now you see what it looks like here when you aren't here. <laughs> So we're going to have to start meeting. I'm going to have to start coming on Wednesday nights, and we're still going to live stream, and we're going to keep live streaming. on it. I've got to find a more permanent method. If there's anybody out there that can help me find a more permanent method that makes this work better than using my phone on a tripod two feet away from me, you let me know. All right? Um, I was going to say something else, and I got all distracted by that. Praise the Lord. Well, we've been talking about being made clean, and, you know, we... Uh, we are on week three of Be Clean of what I thought was a one-time message. I thought it was a one-time message. Anyway, 
We're on week three of Be Clean. Open up your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. And I don't bookmark my stuff, so it takes me just as long as it takes you. So I don't get ahead of you. You know, because it's easy for the preacher to get ahead of everybody else. Because they got everything written down. <laughs> Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. Jesus says, he says, when he had the multitude uh, to, him, to himself, he said to them, hear, hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth that defiles the man or the person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles the person. Skip on down to verse 17, verse 16. So Jesus said, are you still without understanding? Because Peter said, please explain this to us. We've paused on that several times. Jesus said it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person. See, these people were so steeped in religious tradition that you were unclean if you didn't wash your hands before you ate. I mean, most children would be dead from defilement if that was true, right? Did you know that dirt is actually good for you? It, it, it helps to build up your immune system. It helps to fight depression. That's right. Josiah's looking at me like I'm crazy. So they, they need someone to explain this to them. So he says, are you still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? Mm -hmm. Do we need to talk about that? No. Okay, I didn't think so. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a person. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. And we talked about all these things. He said, these things, these are the things that defile a man. But to eat without unwashed hands does not defile a man. Well, that just flies in the face of who and CDC, doesn't it? Yeah. Who are you going to trust? Jesus? Or are you going to trust man? Jesus. I'm going to trust Jesus. <laughs> but I, I also know enough to wash my hands if they're filthy. You know, because sometimes it's just gross. So it's not food in and of itself that makes you clean. It's not eating with, with, with unwashed hands that makes you clean. It's, it's what's on the inside. And so we've been talking about this. What's on the inside of a person is what, what defiles a person. What you let in. What you, will, what you allow yourself to think about. We talked about, I, uh, last week I talked about um, Keith Moore. He's a wonderful preacher, pastor. Uh, he's got two churches, and he spends one month in one church and another month, the next month in the other church. And, and uh, he's a fantastic preacher and teacher. And all the men in his family died, I think it was like, we'll say 45. Because I, I don't remember exactly. All the men died at, we'll just say 45. And so as he was growing up, he just started to believe that, you know, because all the men in his family died at 45, his dad died, his grandpa died, his uncle died, everybody died at 45. So he just figured he wasn't going to live past 45. Well, then he got saved and he started reading his Bible. Did you know that reading your Bible will change your life? Yes, you did, didn't you? I'm making myself dizzy nodding just for effect here. Because the Bible will change your life. Did the Bible, did reading the Bible or hearing about what God said in the Bible regarding Jesus, did that change your life? Yes. Well, imagine what the rest of it will do for you. Right? Imagine what the rest of it will do for you. So let's look over here at uh, Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4. <coughs> Philippians chapter 4 says, Be anxious for nothing. Boy, that's really good just right there, isn't it? Yeah. Right now and today, it's so easy to be anxious, isn't it? Yes. But, but Jesus... Through Paul is saying, be anxious for nothing. You know, let's just really pause on that for a moment. Philosophy would have you believe that men wrote the Bible. No. God spoke through and used men to write the Bible. This is completely different, okay? Um, you might have your favorite author, 
you know, Patterson or Dean Kuntz or, you know, you know somebody else, and you think, wow, you know, they, they're such a great author. But they wrote a book and told a story. That is not the same as God speaking through men or women to speak his word or to write down his word, okay? So when we say, when we say Paul wrote, we're really saying Paul, being used by the Holy Spirit, is writing this to us. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Oh, it's so good to have peace. You know, through this whole thing, I had plenty of opportunity not to have peace. Let's keep reading. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. So Paul's given us a pretty good list of things to think about instead of things that make you anxious, isn't he? How many of us actually put into practice? Can you imagine if every time you were given an opportunity to get anxious, if every time we were given an opportunity to worry, if every time we were given an opportunity to be scared or concerned about something, if we would start thinking about something that is pure, about something that's lovely. I love this one, something that's of a good report. Then he goes on, he says, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Remember, in, in Joshua, God told Joshua to meditate on his word day and night. To meditate literally means to murmur, mutter to yourself. So see, some murmuring is good. If it's biblical murmuring, you're murmuring to yourself. You're not murmuring about your spouse. You're not murmuring about your boss. You know, you're not murmuring about your teachers. Right? Right? To meditate, to murmur on these things, that means you go around and you just are speaking it to yourself. When Kathy was pregnant with Faith and we'd lost our first baby uh, the year before, she would go around the house and I would hear her talking. And I always want, what? What are you saying? She says, nothing, I'm just telling the baby how she's going to be. Nothing, I'm just telling the baby how things are going to go. Nothing, I'm just, tell, I'm, just, I'm just speaking over this baby. All right. So long before she was born, 15 weeks premature, weighing 13 ounces which gave us just naturally plenty of things to look at and be anxious over. Mm -hmm. We had already spoken her destiny. Yes. Yeah. Come on, we, didn't, we weren't at home wondering and, and you know, oh, I just hope everything's gonna be okay with this pregnancy. Gee, you know, it, everything went so bad, so fast, so suddenly with, 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 with David and, and it just, you know, if, if we'd have just focused on that, Instead of refocusing our minds, refocusing our efforts, refocusing our energies, refocusing ourselves spiritually and mentally on what we wanted to see as an outcome instead of what looked like was the most... Do you know the doctors told us after we lost David, they, they told us, specialists, specialists told us, this is how it will always be. You will never be able to carry a child, much less to full term. Okay, that's what they told us. I had family tell me, it's not fair for you. This is funny. These are abortion-loving people. <laughs> Telling us that it was unfair to the baby for us to keep trying to get pregnant <laughs> because it makes them suffer. That's right. You got it. Oh, brother. Again, I'm not opposed to, to people who've had an abortion. I know plenty. I drove somebody to an abortion once before I knew better. God still loves people who've had abortions. Mm -hmm. If he didn't, it would say in here, if you've had an abortion, God could never forgive you. <laughs> but it doesn't say that. No sin is, un, is, is unforgivable. Nothing, nothing we do is unforgivable. The only thing that you can do that's unforgivable is to die without making Jesus your Lord. There, once, once that happens, there's no going back. There, there's no going back after that. The, the, your, your, seat, your, your fate has been sealed. These things 
which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me. So he's not telling them to do something he himself didn't do. He's telling them to do something that they saw him do. This is the church he's writing to, the church at Philippi. Do you remember what happened at Philippi? Philippi is where they cast that devil out of that young girl that was following them around, and they ended up in jail. Do you think that Paul had opportunity to be anxious if he was in jail? But do y'all remember what happened to him? They began to sing and to worship the Lord in jail. So we're, we're, we're pregnant with faith. And, and they've put Kathy on bed rest, and then they put her in the hospital, and they're monitoring her. Do you know what we didn't do? We didn't start calling everybody and say, well, this looks like it's it. They're only giving her a 50-50 chance to live. Maybe next time will be better. No. I, well, I went to bed after she was born. And I woke up many times during the night and I declared while having bad dreams I would wake up and say no she will live and not die and she will declare the glory of God you can change your life you can change your destiny listen when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior you made the biggest decision of your entire life you made the best decision of your entire life when you did that you can make every other decision in your life based on the same knowledge and the same information and have an infinitely better life than you ever thought you could have. Brother Moore is in his 60s now. The preacher who, who every, all the men in his family died at 45. Wow. He's, he's got to be in his 60s now. I mean, he was, I think he was, his, he was my age 20 years ago, so he's probably older than that. Looks good, though. Brother Moore looks good, can still sing too. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen? These do, and the God of peace will be with you. So he's showing them. He said, you know, when you're in jail, you sing a song. When you're going through a trial, sing a song. When you're going through something that's hard, you start focusing your mind on something bigger. You know what a magnifying glass does? It magnifies something that's small and makes it bigger. We say we magnify God. God's already big. When we're magnifying God, we're changing our direction. We're changing our mental focus. We're focusing on the bigger thing here. Amen. We're focusing on the eternal thing here. You can start changing your life right now. You might have been given, I know people that have been given death, death sentences from cancers and from other diseases. They're doing fine now. Amen. Why? Because they chose not to focus on the report. See, Paul says right here, he says, whatever things are of good report. Well, let's keep talking about it, okay? Well, I... Look at that. I've left my notes completely. <laughs> it's so unusual, right? It's so unlike you. It's, thank you, Faith. It's so unlike me to lose my place and get completely off my notes and start doing something different. Listen, you know, this is why, you know, I sit over here and I'm praying and I'm asking God for help, okay? When, when, this, when this coronavirus thing hit and churches started closing down, we'd already closed down the week before that because we had so much snow. We weren't sure we were going to be able to meet the following week, which was the first week that they were asking churches to close. We weren't sure. And I'm thinking to myself, I just, the church just gave me a raise. And now we're going through this financial crisis. And Kathy's, Kathy's unemployed. I mean, she's, she's, on, she's on furlough, you know. And, and can I tell you, there's plenty of opportunity to be concerned. How's the church going to pay its bills, much less pay me? Because I'm not going to let the church default on anything in order to pay me. Why? Because I'm trusting God to take care of me. So we... We had opportunity to fear. Not once, except for maybe, I think, just for a couple of minutes, one time at home, I thought to myself, well, what if I don't get paid? And then I had to retract on that. Why? Because I'm not going to go down this what-if road. 
I'm going to go down the road of because I'm a sower and a giver and a tither and I'm faithful, that God is going to be faithful to me, Amen. that he's going to provide for my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so we're just going to move on from that point, right? right. We're, we have to move on from the point where you, you, you have a decision that you're going to make. This is how things look in the natural. This is how the word of God says it's going to be. If God says it's going to be this way, Paul said focus on whatever is true, didn't he? Well, what's true? True supersedes fact. You can have a whole list of facts. You're not working. Your spouse isn't working. Uh, your, 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 your place of business is closed down. The church is closed down. All the people in church can't come to church. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to start taking church to people. Amen. We're going to start making everything accessible online. Do you know that the devil tried to tell me how, how selfish and greedy I was when we, made, when we made online giving available? All you're concerned about is money. No, I'm concerned about people being able to give to God. And do you know that people were still giving to God and sending stuff in? And calling about how they can continue to give and do their, their tithe and offering. Because they know they're giving to God. See, isn't that just like the devil? Well, you're just, you're just being greedy. You're just money hungry. You just, you just want to be healthy for your own good. Well, yeah! Of course I want to be healthy for my own good. Have you ever been sick? It's no fun. It's not fun to be sick. I want, you know, raise your hand out there. Wave at me if you think being sick is fun. Well, I can tell you nobody here waved wave, wave, wave their hand. Josiah's waving his hand. <laughs> <laughs> What's she going to do? Listen, tithes, not only, not only did God, did God continue to work through people in the giving of tithes and offerings in this church, but tithes and offerings went up. During this. And I can tell you that we applied for the payroll protection plan. And we were approved for over $10,000 on the payroll protection plan. Well, we haven't had a problem paying payroll. So we're going to pay my payroll out of the payroll protection plan for the next five pay periods, which is what they give us to do it, to spend that money, 75% of it. Don't you think that helps the church? Yes. It does. It helps us. It enables us to, to, to continue to help, to help widows and the poor people in the church and to, to help people in the community and to help missionaries around the world. Why? Because we've got to spread the gospel. We've got to spread the word of Jesus to everybody. Thoughts will come. But just because a thought comes doesn't mean you have to dwell on it. That's right. There you go. Listen, the, out here over in front of the preschool building, uh, one of the, the lights that comes on at night, uh, it's, it's a nice big round semi-circle thing, and it's perfect. Birds love to make nests in it. They love, they love to nest in that thing. You know what we don't love? trying to open the door when birds are nesting right next to it because those birds will attack you. Okay? So this is really important. We go by daily and pull the little twigs out of there so they don't start nesting. Daily, go through your mind and pull those twigs out that are trying to nest. Just because a bird flies over your head, and I know this is an old colloquialism, just because a bird flies over your head doesn't mean you need to let it nest there. Just because a thought comes doesn't mean you need to let it nest there. Just because somebody says something to you doesn't mean you need to agree with it. Oh, you're right. I'm not very smart. I'm not really that good at math. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as pretty as so-and-so. God, God isn't looking at you on the outside saying, oh, I don't. You're not as pretty as sister so-and-so. And, you know, I'm, I'm just going to favor her more because she's prettier and she makes a better presentation. Yeah, sister so-and-so is probably Karen. You know, Karen and all the memes. 
<laughs> you know who Karen is. <laughs> I got people looking at me like I'm like I have no idea who Karen is. Does she come to this church? <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> Every Karen that was at this church left because I didn't approve of Karen. <laughs> Listen, I don't have time for Karens or whatever you want to call them. You know, we don't have time for those people who are always, who are always, who come to you with a smile and say, oh, you look so pretty. That's not really your color though, is it? <laughs> 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 Oh, I, I was sitting behind you in church this morning. No one makes a joyful noise like you do. <laughs> That's Karen. She comes with a smile and makes you feel bad about yourself, right? Yeah. Right? Nobody wants Karen. Karen, change. You too can make a 180 degree turn. This is all we have to do is make a 180 degree turn away from what is, what is, what is that thought that's in your mind because listen, I love a sense of humor, but when you allow those things that are contrary to the word of God to come out of your mouth, you are cursing. That's right. You are cursing your life. That's you right. are cursing your family. You're cursing your relationships. When uh, Kathy and I agreed before we ever got married that we would never ever, that divorce would never be something that we would discuss. And so no matter how mad I get, I won't bring up divorce. And she has had plenty of opportunities to bring it up to me, too. <laughs> Don't curse yourself by, by, by assuming that just because this is the way things were, or this is how things look, that that's how things are going to be. Don't assume because the government is shut down that, things, that your life has to cease going and that things are going to be worse off for you. The children of Israel were in Goshen while the plagues were happening in the same land that they were in, but they weren't affected by it. There you go. Plagues, Jesus said, in the end times, in the latter days, there's going to be plagues and famines and pestilences and wars and rumors of wars. He said, but don't fear. Amen. So don't be anxious. So what? You can't go to work. Spend more time with your children. Spend more time. You know, here, here's the this thing. It's, let, let's not go down that road. Don't curse your life. Don't curse your health. Don't curse your wife. Don't curse your children. Well, you're just not very good at that. Don't do that. When you speak down to someone, you are cursing them. That's where real defilement comes. Because, you know the old saying, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I would much rather you throw a stick at me or throw a rock at me than to say negative things that, that, that are going to enter into my mind. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would, listen, I, I, we, we do what we call the, the Gibbs slap. If you've ever watched NCIS, the Gibbs slap, you know, you, yeah, that, the Gibbs slap. I do that to Josiah. I'm like, you know, stop it. But don't, don't talk down and degrade people because that defiles, it defiles them and it defiles you. Trust me, I know. Faith isn't just believing for, the, for, for things like physical health and financial, financial you know, jobs and better jobs and stuff like that. Those are benefits of faith. But real faith is living a life that glorifies and honors God. Amen. That's the real faith. I don't care if you've got tattoos from the top of your head to the soles of your feet and everywhere that's seen and unseen. You have not defiled yourself because of a tattoo. You defile yourself because of your attitude and your words and the things that come out of your heart. That's right. And those are the things that defile. Don't do that. It honors God. Listen, this, it honors him and blesses him when we do and say the things that come into agreement with him. Why? Let's look at Job. Job 3.25. And you, you can write this down or... Because, or, man, the time goes by so much faster when we do it this way. It's not really, is it? I'm just having a better time, huh? 
Job 3.25, he says, What I have always feared or greatly feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has come true. Now you go back there and you read Job and you'll find out that he was going in Job 1 and Job 2. He was going out and he was making sacrifices to God in case his children sinned. So what is Job's fear? That his children have sinned against God and God will reject them. So he is living his fear. He is acting out his fear. He is, he is, he is, if, he, if he has gone so far as to make sacrifices and offerings, I guarantee you he's been talking about it. Because it's in his heart and it's coming out in his lifestyle. It's coming out in his, his way of, of, of being. Okay, Job had uncontrolled, Job had uncontrolled fear and anxiety over his children sinning against God. I want to tell you, moms, dads, grandparents, you cannot control people. Karen, you can't control us. Karens, well, I like that. Karens like to control people. Do you know, I've been in this church, we're, we're in our fifth year here. I've been in this church long enough to have several Karens going by different names try to tell me how wrong I was. And I'll tell you, if you dwell on that, I had somebody crying and yelling at me for two hours in my office about how I wasn't what they wanted and what they expected. Well, God bless them. God blessed me for not carrying on about it and getting into a big deal and moved that person to another state. That's how much God loves you. If you'll just not let that person get under your skin, God will move them on. You'll have passed the test of being thrown in jail. <laughs> you will have passed the test. Job 2.9, when Satan began to, his attack on Job, killing, stealing, and destroying. We were talking yesterday, said something, and, and Jesus said, well, that's Satan because he steals, kills, and destroys. Come on, if, if you learn nothing else about God and the devil, Satan comes only to kill, steal, and to destroy. So it's killing, stealing, and destroying in your life. It's not God. There you go. Amen. Don't, don't ask God to make it go by quickly. You speak to that thing. You start dealing with it. God didn't send it to you. Jesus said he came to give life and that more abundantly. Amen. He was, Satan was... was De killing, stealing, and destroying Job's family, his health, his finances. And his wife said to him, her best advice to him. This was the first time his wife speaks. <clears throat> Job's wife said to him, do you still retain your integrity? Just curse God and die. He maintained his Dignity, no matter what else Job was doing that he, he greatly feared and those things happened to him, he refused to curse God and to say, listen, do you know how many Christians I've heard and how many sermons I've heard where God is the villain in this story who decided that he was going to pick on Job and send the devil after him? Job's wife asked, do you still have your integrity? What does she mean? You have not cursed God in all of this. Surely God is the one who did this. When we had so much snow last winter that it, it knocked the solar panels out, we didn't find out about it for months. Insurance companies call that an act of God. Yeah. God didn't do that. Yeah. That's the devil. He's trying to destroy things. He's trying to ruin things. When you allow those thoughts into your mind, who are you lining up with? Oh, come on, be honest with yourself. Are you lining up with God when you say that this cancer or sickness came on you and, and you're going to bless God anyway and maybe God, God allowed this so that you could slow down and get closer to him? No. No. But when we, when we allow words and actions of defilement out of our mouths that defile our lives, God will not force his blessing on you anyway. That's right. Because God wants you to learn the difference. 
He wants us to learn the difference between allowing him to control our thoughts and our, and our hearts and allowing the world or the devil to control our thoughts and our hearts. Most Christians have enough sense not to say most that God did this to me, but will give God all the credit that it happened, coming short of saying God did this to me. The reason is, is that most Christians don't know enough of Scripture to know the difference between God and the devil. Do you know Billy, uh, not Billy, uh, Oral Roberts back in the 1950s? He got in so much trouble because he went around saying, God is good and the devil is bad. All these sicknesses and disease that come on you, they're from the devil. Well, people were so attached to their, to their old doctrinal theology that God is the one who did this to you to teach you a lesson. Which you can't find that in scripture anywhere. It's a tradition of men. Just like if you don't wash your hands ceremonially clean the way the rabbis and the Pharisees have told you that you should, that what you're eating is defiling you. That Jesus had to go back and say, are you still without understanding? It's not what you eat that defiles you. Go ahead, eat ham. I don't care. Don't wash your hands. I don't care because that's not going to defile you. It's what you allow in your heart. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, he said that our warfare, let's look at that. Second Corinthians chapter 10. Start in verse 1. Well, this is going to be a four-part message then, for sure. How about that? <laughs> it was one part, now it's going to be four parts. Verse 1, chapter, chapter 10, 2 Corinthians. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you. Paul is pleading with you. I am pleading with you. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in the presence, who in presence am I, am I am lowly among you about being absent, but I am bold towards you. I beg you that when I may, that when I am present with you, uh, when I am present, I may not behold with what with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh, for we walk. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. So your battle isn't fleshly. Kathy will tell me, she says, I'm not your enemy. I am not your enemy. Okay, I'm not your enemy here. We do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Listen, verse 5. Casting down arguments and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing, listen, what? Every thought, every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. What does that mean? It, he's, Paul says, I'm begging you. Your battle is not against flesh and blood. Your battle, our battle is not carnal. It's spiritual. It's supernatural. It's mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So you don't need to stand in a chair and start shouting at the heavenlies, at principalities and powers in the air, because that's not what's happening. What's happening is Paul is saying, you need to take every thought captive. That's right. Is this a God thought that I'm dwelling on? Yes. Is, God, is God the one who is, who, who is behind this thought pattern in my mind? Is God the one who has put this thought, these thoughts and these imaginations in my mind, casting down every thought and imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and punishing all disobedience? What does that mean? It means to correct yourself. When you have thoughts that are contrary to God, go ahead, own it. You can even tell God, God, I've been having these thoughts that are contrary to you, and I just cast them down in Jesus' name, and I need thoughts to replace those thoughts. And so you start putting in right thoughts, lovely thoughts, pure thoughts, holy thoughts, 
true thoughts, right? Mm -hmm. You might get a doctor's report. But Paul said, focus on the good report. Yes. Who's, whose report will you believe? And we'll stop there for today. Whose report will you believe? And we are going to pick up on this again next week. Yes. Amen? Amen? We're going to get ready to take communion this morning. Um, I, want to, I want to read that passage again in 1 Corinthians 11. Because here's, here's a big thing that we're going to read on that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I'm going to start in verse 29 and then we'll, we'll go back up. And when we're ready to take communion, you can just come over here and get it. Or you know what? Why don't you guys... Um, do you want to start coming over? No, you, you need to listen. <laughs> verse 29. You like that? That's just, that's just me trying to figure out what God wants to do. For he who eats and drinks in a manner unworthy, in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are sick and weak among you, and many sleep. And that doesn't mean they're taking naps. That means they've died prematurely. They're dead. Because when, when we take the Lord's, the Lord's Supper, when we partake of communion, we're partaking of his body and his blood. And we're, it's, it's, not, we're not just, it's not just a mid-morning snack. I mean, Paul, Paul had to rebuke the church at Corinth. This was the most spiritually diverse group of people. They had, I mean, all the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit were operating <laughs> in that church. They were immature. They were babies. I love the spiritual gifts, but spiritual gifted, giftedness does not equate maturity. Being spiritually gifted doesn't mean you're mature. It means that you, 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 you have allowed the Holy Spirit to work through you. Many sleep and, and, and are sick because we're not properly looking at our lives and, 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 and examining ourselves to find out if we actually believe what the communion represents. Do I believe that when I eat this, when I eat this wafer, I am, in, I am in essence saying, I receive the broken body of Jesus because by his stripes I was healed. You can come up forward. You can start over here on this side and um, come on over here. And... I have them off camera so they're, you know, no one knows who's here. <laughs> Unless they checked in. I don't know. And I'm going I'm to turn to my Bible to Isaiah. Well, you guys can circle around the back over here. Don't, don't come in front of the camera, though, okay? So just go back around. I hope you guys are getting your communion ready at home. This is, this is heavy subject matter, but this is life-changing subject matter. This is life-transforming subject matter. This is, this is you're going to get yourself right with God. You're going to get yourself right in your own head. You're going to get yourself right in your own actions and, and, and attitudes and behaviors. Why? Because you want to live long and strong in this world. That's, listen, living long and strong is the best testimony that you can have for God. The best testimony you can have for God is that when everybody else was sick, I didn't get sick. The best testimony you can have from God is when the, everybody else was going under financially, we didn't. We went, listen, I've been saying this since we went into this. We're coming through this better on the other side than we went into this. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're going through better. Listen, we are coming through this so much better on the other side that it, it, it pales in comparison with how well things looked before we went into it. 
We, we, are, we are those believers who line up with the word of God. And we're, we're, we're Goshen, man. We're the children of Israel living in the land of Goshen where there's famine and pestilence and, and plagues all around, but it's not touching us. I'm untouched by the plague. I'm untouched. You know, even when you say that, you hear yourself say, I'm not going to get it. And then you hear this little voice say, you don't know that for sure. Yeah, I do. I know with 100% certainty. And if I did get it, I'd be one of those people who's asymptomatic, who never even knew that they had it. Why? Because no sickness or disease can come upon me and overtake me, except that which is common to men. And just, listen, you don't have to. We don't have to. God doesn't want us to be like the world and suffer everything that the world is suffering through. Jesus himself already did that. Isaiah 53, verse 3 starts, it says, He is despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows. Okay? In verse 3, the word sorrows there is literally the word pain. Okay? And acquainted with grief. The word for grief there is literally sickness. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with sickness. And he, we hid as it were. See, he took our pain and our sickness and he took that to the cross with him. So we don't have to. I said last week, I used to get these cluster migraines. They would hit just the right side of my head. It felt like somebody hit me with a baseball bat. And they would hurt for an hour or so. And they'd go away. And I could get one or two a day. I could, and and they, I would get them every day for months. And then they'd just vanish. And then all of a sudden, it had come back one day. Well, we were getting ready to get married. And, and I would get up. And I, I would get up in the middle of the night. And I would wake up with one of those headaches. And I would walk the living room. And I would say, thank you, Lord, that you took my pain so I don't have to. Here's another thing. I also took some medication because that helps too. That's right. You do everything you can not to be sick. You take the medication, you change the diet, you do whatever you want to do, whatever you need to do. But you better be believing God too. That's right. Since then, I have never had them come back, ever. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he hath borne our griefs Again, that's our, our sickness and carried our sorrows. That's our pain. And we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. Isn't that funny? But he was, listen, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised. That means he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we were healed. 1 Peter 2.24 Peter writes, and he says, by his stripes, you were healed. You were. If you were already healed, that means you were already healed, right? If your sins are already forgiven, are they already forgiven? Yes. Yeah. Well, if your sins were already forgiven, and you just had to receive that, then you were already healed from sickness and disease. You just have to receive that too. Amen? Amen? So let's start talking it. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, for this little wafer that represents the broken body of Jesus, that by the stripes on his back, we were healed, and we received that this morning in Jesus' name. Take and eat. And this cup of juice represents your blood that was shed for our transgressions, for our sins. We have been forgiven of our sins. We are forgiven of our sins. We will be forgiven of our sins. We have been healed. We are healed. We will be healed. And we receive the salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't want to close out without this verse. If you've never made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, now is the best time in the world to do it. Amen. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't have an 11th hour plan because you don't know when he's coming. <coughs> Amen. Let's all pray together. We're going to just pray real quick. Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Do something wonderful with my life. I receive it right now in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Praise God. We love you. We love you so much. I miss seeing all of you. And have a wonderful week. And I'll see you guys again on Wednesday night. Thank you. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank you. Thank Praise you. the Lord.